have fun in children's church. Everyone else, if you want to turn your Bibles to the book of Exodus, chapter 17. You might also turn to the book of Numbers, chapter 14, and just put a bookmark in there because those are our our two passages uh, this morning. In my first years as a youth pastor here, there were three guys that made ministry impossibly difficult. And I've asked them if I could share this. These three guys, none of them are here today, by the way, so you're not all looking around like, who is this? These three guys were best friends. And they were hilarious, and they knew it. And they were also incredibly gifted musicians, and they knew it. And this made them sort of an unstoppable force in our youth group. And one night at youth group, uh, we were actually right here in this room for a season. We were doing stuff in here. And we were doing our thing, and they had been uh, playing on the youth worship team, and they finished playing, and they came and sat down. And honestly, that night, I don't remember what it was that they did. It was whatever they always do. But that night, I, I hit my limit, and I was done. And I literally just walked out and right in the middle of whatever I was saying and I I went into that hallway right there and as I got back there I was suddenly overwhelmed with emotion and I found myself starting to cry and so that freaked me out a little uh, because I've not always been what you would call the most uh, emotionally gifted of people but something had happened something that went deeper than I had realized Uh, and had been building for some period of time. And after I regained my composure, I came back in, I finished youth group, and then afterwards I took these boys aside to talk. And I hadn't thought at all about what I was going to say, but the first thing I blurted out was, why do you guys hate me? And And that's an interesting question, right? They immediately tried to make me feel better. Of course we don't hate you. What are you talking about? We think you're an awesome youth pastor and, and that kind of stuff. But to me, my, my instinctive question only confirmed what my tears earlier had suggested, which was that I felt hated. Whether or not I actually was, that's how I felt. And, and I know of very few other experiences worse than feeling hated by people that you, have, you feel like you've done so much for. I I imagine some of you parents know this feeling, perhaps more acutely than most. We're going to take a look at two passages this morning. And And when we come to the second one, we will hear in God the voice of a grieved father. How long will this people despise me, he says, How long will they not trust me in spite of all of the signs that I have done among them? But how does God come to this point of grief? What would bring God to lament and despair over these people? Well, God reveals himself because he wants to be known. And God laments when he reveals himself to the creatures that bear his image and they remain unaffected, they remain unchanged. This is the general shape of our passages this morning. God encounters his people. God instructs or teaches his people and his people return the favor with general disinterest. And I want to give you an example of how this this story unfolds. Since you guys are right in front of me, I'm going to use Alex and Allie. If that's okay. Can I can I use you guys for an example? Cool. Uh, Alex just hypothetically met Allie this morning out in the lobby. Which man, you're fast. Put our, okay. So they caught they kind of caught eyes in the foyer. Uh, they happened to start up a little conversation before service, and Alex worked up the guts to ask Allie to go out on Tuesday night. They are very excited about this. There's, there's clearly an attraction. As they prepare for their first date, Alex decides he's going to do something really special for Allie. He decides to get her flowers. So he goes and he buys some roses on his way to meet her. 
And as they walk up to the restaurant, Alex holds out the roses to give to Allie and clearly touched. Allie says, oh, that was so thoughtful of you. They're beautiful, but I'm so sorry. I'm allergic to roses. We're just going to pretend you're allergic to roses. Um, but I'm allergic to roses. Burn. But not, right? Because Ali actually really appreciates the gesture and found it romantic and thoughtful. Because there was absolutely no way for Alex to already know that, that Ali was allergic to roses. And so Ali doesn't have even the slightest frustration or resentment for the act. However, Ali has now set Alex straight. She has given him new data, new information to integrate into his thinking and to change his future actions. If Alex shows up to their next date with roses, Ali is going to be a little irritated. And what if Alex keeps bringing roses? Or decides at every anniversary to be nostalgic. Remember, I got these for you on our first date. The real question at that point is whether Alex remembers. And this frustrates Allie. Actually, it would begin to grieve her over time because, right, you begin to feel undervalued, unheard, and ultimately disrespected. Allie at that point has revealed something to Alex, but Alex has refused to integrate that information into his being in such a way that his actions change. When we read biblical stories, this is often what we're listening for. Based on an initial encounter between God and people, what does God have to say? And how are the people changed or unchanged as a result of what God has spoken? In our second passage, God will explain his lament this way. You have put me to the test these 10 times and have continued to not obey my voice. 10 tests is a lot of tests, right? And as Lauren reminded us two weeks ago, we test because we do not trust. Trust, this is what God is seeking to create in these people who are newly freed from their slavery. Which is why when, when God's people were thirsty, he showed that he is able to turn bitter water into drinkable water. He showed that he's able to bring his people to springs of water in the middle of a barren wilderness. And that he's able even to bring water out of rocks. For over a year, God quenched the Israelites' desert thirsts. Because God wants a people who trust him. When his people grew hungry, God showed that he is able to provide for them their daily bread. And he's even able, as he demonstrated, to mix it up on occasion and provide a little meat. For over a year, God satisfied the Israelites' desert hunger. The world is a dangerous place. Can God be trusted in such a world? Sure, God defeated the Egyptians. But is God able in an ongoing way to protect the Israelites from all of the desert's dangers? And, and so let's turn to Exodus 18, 8 and explore this very thing. Seventeen eight. Sorry about that. Tricked you. Seeing who was with me. Then Amalek came and fought with Israel at Rephidim. So Moses said to Joshua, choose for us men and go out and fight with Amalek. We already notice a difference in the way God deals with desert danger. The last time the Israelites were faced with an approaching enemy, God himself put a physical barrier between them and the approaching army. And then God created a sort of back door for the Israelites to escape through the sea. And then God himself defeated the enemy army. But here now, the people are called to action. This is the first time we encounter Joshua in the Bible. And Joshua is called to lead 
selecting faithful servants who will face these enemies together. Moses continues, And tomorrow I will stand on the top of the hill with the staff of God in my hand. Moses intends to make very clear that whatever is about to happen is going to be a continuation of what God did in Egypt. The staff of God visible in Moses' hands is always a sign. It's a sign that God is at work, that God's power is being demonstrated among us. God, who leads Moses and Israel, can be trusted. He is with us. So the story goes on. Joshua did as Moses told him and fought Amalek. An Israelite other than Moses receives instruction and obeys. This is a good sign considering where we've been, right? And as we might expect, God works through these faithful leaders and the Israelites experience a decisive victory. In verse 13, we read, And Joshua overwhelmed Amalek and his people with the sword. Then the Lord said to Moses, Write this as a memorial in a book and recite it in the ears of Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under heaven. As an individual story, there are certainly many other things that we could jump into and explore here in this passage, but connected to the Israelites' next encounter with the Amalekites, we've covered most of the essentials. Without a trained or a standing army, God is able to counter a serious military threat using the faithful trust of a couple leaders. This is a huge lesson because in just over a year from this point at this story, these people will not just be reacting to desert threats, but they will be going on the offensive in an extended way. The land is where they are heading and this first battle against the Amalekites suggests something about the way forward. But God clarifies so if you'll turn with me to chapter 23, so just flip over a couple pages. God begins to instruct his people. Look at verse 20. Here we receive or we hear the instructions that are supposed to help the Israelites to trust the Lord. We've had the encounter and now here are the instructions. Behold, I send an angel before you to guard you on the way and to bring you to the place that I have prepared. Pay careful attention to him and obey his voice. Do not rebel against him. Pick up in verse 22. But if you carefully obey his voice and do all that I say, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. When my angel goes before you and brings you to the Amorites and to the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites, the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I blot them out, you shall not bow down to them nor serve them. And then in verse 27, I will send my terror before you and I will throw into confusion all of the people against whom you shall come. And I will make all your enemies turn their backs to you and I will drive them out. So I, I've only highlighted some of the key phrases from this block of instruction, but here, in the most clear and concise way possible, God affirms what he told Moses close to the beginning of the book of Exodus. God is going to take his people into the land. But, and this is the part that might be news to the Israelites, it's going to require something from them. They are going to have to participate in acquiring this land, in fighting for this land. But, Again, these instructions are directly related to the experiences they have already had with God. The enemies that they face in the land are to be blotted out the way that the Amalekites are to be blotted out. Remember how easy that victory was? Well, same here, our text implies. In a moment of incredible clarity, 
God tells his people exactly what he is going to do. And he does it by building off what he has already done. What I did to the Egyptians at the sea and what I did to the Amalekites at Rephidim, that's what I intend to do for you to get you into Canaan. And this is then exactly what we hear Paul saying when we get to the New Testament. What God did for Jesus, raising him from the dead, this is what he will do for you when all are raised from the dead and death is blotted out. He doesn't use the word blotted, but it worked. Uh, Same general idea. Death is done away with. In the wilderness, God has been laying the groundwork for trust. God is leading the Israelites to the land of Canaan where they will have to fight. And at every step, he has been proving that he is able to do what he has promised to do so that when the time comes to fight, Israel will unflinchingly press forward to possess the land. Trust begins and it matures in the wilderness. And in this life, God has laid the groundwork for our trust. God has in store for us a life free from slavery to sin and free from the fear of death. And at every step, God has demonstrated his ability to do what he has promised so that when we are faced with the temptation to sin or prospect of death, we will unflinchingly press forward trusting the God who raised Jesus from the dead and has brought us out of slavery to sin. Trust begins and matures here and now. Which then brings us to our second passage this morning. It's a year later from the the battle against the Amalekites in the wilderness. Israel has spent a year at Sinai. God has provided for them. He has protected them. And now he has brought them to the border of the land. And as they arrive, each of the 12 tribes select a leader to go out into the land together and to spy it out. And when they return, two reports come back. The first report comes back from two of the leaders, Joshua and Caleb. And they exclaim, this is my paraphrase, let's go. It's exactly as God promised. And the other report brought by the other 10 spies went something like, they are bigger, they're stronger. That way is treacherous. We should not go that way. In Exodus, the faithfulness of a couple leaders Moses and Joshua, Aaron and Hur, what was sufficient for God to bring Israel to victory. But God doesn't intend for his people to rely on the faithfulness of their leaders. Not forever. God expects the people to begin to live faithfully themselves. During my first year as a youth pastor here, There were quite a few people who who left during the transition between pastors. And I remember somebody telling me that that was to be expected. Those were the people that Pastor Dave had brought to the church. And then several years later, I I overheard someone asking uh, about Pastor Rick. What was he doing to grow the church? And, And that made me interested. And so I pulled out one of our church directories and I counted the number of people who were new in the church. And by far, uh, it turned out the majority of them had come because of he and his family. And, And then I left and with me went the youth group that I had brought into the church. At that point, very few of our students had grown up in the church. Our history reveals that when it comes to making disciples, our congregation has generally generally relied on the faithfulness of its pastors. Whether each of the pastors have been faithful or not, we we have generally expected disciple making to be done by pastors. So Claudia, thanks for your reflections earlier. But this is why when the board moved forward with hiring another pastor uh, within the last two years, 
We made very clear in our conversations and have tried to make clear at every possible turn that, that we were not hiring someone who was going to fight for us. This person was not going to make our disciples for us. We were bringing somebody in who, with us who was going to come alongside us and help us to be disciples and to make disciples for ourselves. And, and so our decision to invite Derek to come and serve with us a couple years ago was a decision that requires each of us every single one of us to trust God by pressing forward and growing as disciples and making disciples ourselves. And the question we're faced with every single day is which report will we follow? Will we follow the one that says, we can't do it because we don't know how, or it's too hard, nobody cares, nobody will listen, fill in the blank. Or will we listen to the report that says, God has called us. He has brought us out of slavery. He is delivering us. He has redeemed us. He has given us his spirit and his word, and we are able. We begin to read in Numbers chapter 14, and here we confront Israel and what they do when they receive conflicting reports. Numbers chapter 14. Then all of the congregation raised a loud cry and the people wept that night. And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron. The whole congregation said to them, would that we had died in the land of Egypt or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land just to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become prey. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? And they said to one another, let us choose a leader and go back to Egypt. Regardless of what God had done and said, the people are, seem completely unaware of what God has promised to do. So they either never paid attention the first time or they have forgotten or they have ignored what God has promised to do. And they've clearly forgotten what he has done. And the only thing they hold in their hands is their fear and their memory of the good old days in Egypt. At the doorstep of God's promise, the Israelites are ready to throw it all away. But their faithful leaders aren't done. Moses and Aaron, Caleb and Joshua are at this point willing to risk their lives to be faithful to God and his word. They are willing to risk their lives to call God's people to trust him and to be faithful themselves. And so they say to the people, to the whole gathered congregation in verse 7, the land which we passed through to spy it out is an exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. Do not fear the people of the land, for they are bred to us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. So I love this assessment of the situation. They are bred to us. Consider their context. For over a year now, these people wake up six days a week and they walk out of their tents and they pick up bread wherever they find it. One day a week, they don't even have to get out of their tents. They don't even have to go outside because they've already collected it the day before. It's just sitting there for them. You know the saying, a piece of cake. This is that. God has already told us that he is with us. This is a bread walk. Let's go collect some loaves. But even with the two leaders, one of them, a proven military commander at this point, 
Even with these two leaders who resolutely declare God's words and remain committed and faithful to God, the people choose to live based on their experiences. The overwhelming experiences of more than 20 years of their lives. Experience is their truth. God's promises must be the lie and they test God's promises because they do not trust him. Verse 11, And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people despise me? How long will they not believe me in spite of all the signs that I have done among them? I mean, you can feel the grief in God's lament. This phrase, how long, is the phrase that will become the echo of the cry of God's people as they long to see God's justice. How long? By now, what should be taking form as trust is only turning into bigger tests. And so, what does God do but give them the desires of their hearts? Having cried out that it would be better to die in the wilderness, he says, okay, you can have it. And the children that they were so insistent on trying to protect, we can't go in because our chil it's dangerous for our children. Well, they are the very ones that now will be required to do the fighting. No, not anytime soon. Because almost 40 years from now, when all of the untrusting and unfaithful Israelites of this generation are gone and dead, then God will take the children into the land. We continue to read. Uh, this is verse 39. When Moses told these words to all the people, that is that they were going to spend an extended period of time uh, in this place that they loved so much, the people mourned greatly. And they rose early in the morning and they went up to the heights of the hill country saying, here we are. We will go up to the place that the Lord has promised for we have sinned. But Moses said, why now are you transgressing the command of the Lord when that will not succeed? Do not go up, for the Lord is not with you, not am among you, lest you be struck down before your enemies. For there the Amalekites and the Canaanites are facing you, and you shall fall by the sword, because you have turned your back from following the Lord. The Lord will not be with you. But they presumed to go up to the heights of the hill country, although neither the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord nor Moses departed out from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that hill country came down and defeated them and pursued them, even to Hormah. This is the very definition of tragic. The Amalekites... The people Israel already handedly defeated in battle. The people that God has promised to blot out. They are the ones that defeat you and chase you away running. But here, finally, the Israelites prove God's, faith, God's judgment to be true because they are not interested in God. Only God's blessing as it's given to them without any effort. They're definitely not interested in God's words, but only their own feelings and desires as the source of their, their direction in life. They're certainly not interested in trusting God, only trusting themselves and preserving themselves. And they aren't even interested in preparing the next generation. They fail. They fail epically. And they're told that it's going to be their children who, who are the ones who go into the land, who are to be God's people into the next generation. And 
they can't be bothered with saying, how do we make sure they don't make our mistakes? They only want to grasp what they, that which they don't have. And so God says, let's go. And they say no. And so God says, okay, let's stay. And they say no again. No is what is in their hearts. No is, in the, pa- is the pattern of their lives. And thus the wilderness is transformed. What was merely the way to the promised land is now the home of their exile. The wilderness is where the Israelites would come to learn just how faithful God would remain to a people who grieve him deeply. But this is a lesson learned over time. Would you pray with me?